George Wally was an exceptionally accomplished man, a scholar, a poet, translator, biographer, naval officer, secret agent, scriptwriter for CBC Radio, a gifted amateur musician. People who knew Wally called him a Renaissance man. Everything he did, he did well. I'm Michael DeSanto. I'm an associate professor in the Department of English at Algoma University. For many years, I studied the novels of Joseph Conrad. I was interested in the ways in which he was rewriting the works of his predecessors in his art. I've spent much time reading and teaching the literature and philosophy of the long 19th century from the French Revolution to the First World War. When I was an undergraduate student at Brock University, I studied with a professor named Dr. Brian Crick. In 1985, Brian and a professor from McMaster University named John Ferns published a selection of Wally's essays. When I was in third year, Brian gave me a copy of that book. When I read it at that time, I didn't really grasp Wally's arguments about language and literature and the humanities. After I left Brock, I went to Dalhousie and I studied with Dr. John Baxter. John edited Wally's translation of Aristotle's Poetics. When I studied with him, he rekindled in me an interest in Wally. The website is something I've done with Robin Izzard, the systems librarian here in the Wishart Library at Algoma University. Through the website, we are publishing a selection of Wally's essays and poetry. We have published approximately 30 audio recordings of Wally reading his poems, of him reading poems by other people, for instance, Dunn and Hopkins and Yeats. We have an interview of um, Wally speaking with Elizabeth Hay, the Giller Prize winning novelist. People who knew Wally were deeply impressed by his voice, and we wanted those who don't know him to have an experience of hearing that his voice and experiencing that part of his person. We've published photos from the family, a timeline of his life, a comprehensive bibliography, and a documentary. Behind the public side of the website is a database into which we're gathering Wally's writings and letters from public archives and private collections, most importantly Queen's University archives and the Wally estate. The students working with me here are editing digital images of the original papers and transcribing them and making records to put into the database. We're hoping to gather all of Wally's writings in one place for future scholars and readers to explore. When I first met the Wally family in 2009 to 2010, the widow, Elizabeth Wally, and her children, Catherine, Christopher, and Emily, emphasized very much the importance of gathering together George's poetry. I decided to make that my first task in my study of George Wally. The Complete Poems collects for the first time all of Wally's poetry. Um, in his lifetime, he published two books, Poems 1939 to 1944 and No Man in Island. They both appeared just after the Second World War. Other poems were published in scattered periodicals and books. In the Queen's University archives and in the Wally Estate papers, I discovered approximately 150 poems previously unpublished. Over the last 10 years, I've edited three collections of essays. Coming to edit a collection of poetry was difficult. It was a different experience. I was confronted with a mass of manuscripts and typescripts for these unpublished poems, and I was having to organize them and understand them in a way to identify what Wally's intentions were in writing these poems and what the final copy um, should be to appear in the book. For the published works, it was a little less difficult. I could work from a text from someone else's edition. But those unpublished poems, it was a bit of detective work 
I felt like I was exploring and having to discover what this man was thinking, um, what was important to him, and what final result he was trying to arrive at through the process of writing a poem. When I came to assemble the book, I decided to put the poems together chronologically, and that will allow readers to trace the development of Wally's style of writing over those 50 years. Many of his poems, about half, are written about the Second World War. During his time at war, he was a naval officer and a secret agent. He writes often about his experiences on board destroyers. He was involved in the pursuit and the sinking of the Bismarck, one of the major engagements of the Second World War in the Atlantic Ocean. He writes about rescuing survivors from bombed buildings in London and secret missions that he undertook to the European coast. He writes about what he saw in Sicily and Normandy and his experience of, of seeing what war does to a place and to a people. He also writes about falling in love during war. He met his wife Elizabeth and they married in 1944 in London. It's quite a remarkable range of poetry that he's produced. In the summer of 2014, I decided that one way of introducing him to a new audience of readers would be through a documentary. Here at Algoma University, I worked with Robin Izzard to develop a website to present Wally's works, and we decided that publishing a documentary would be one way to introduce him to the world again. We hired a student named Evan Wanyo. At the time, he was at York University. And I worked with him to write a script and to gather images that we could use to produce the documentary. We are telling the story of Wally's life, beginning with his time during the war, and then moving back to his childhood and working forward um, through his career as a professor at Queen's University and his many accomplishments from the 1950s to the 1980s. I hope you enjoy the film. The Bismarck was all but destroyed. Royal Navy warships had hunted down and demolished the powerful German battleship. Perilously low on fuel after the pursuit, two tribal-class destroyers, the Tartar and the Mashona, left the British fleet and turned for home. George Wally, a 25-year-old sub-lieutenant was aboard the Tartar. It was one in the morning. The sleep that had eluded him for the past several days was denied him once more. Alarms signaled an air attack. German Luftwaffe bombers were overhead. A day-long battle began. The destroyers repelled wave after wave of aircraft, but the Germans finally broke through the anti-aircraft defenses. The Mashona was hit and began to capsize. Seeing three men in the water, Wally leapt into the sea. One man was dead, and the second died before Wally pulled him back to the ship. The third man he saved. In later years, he did not talk about this act of heroism. Courage and his reticence regarding it were characteristic of this exceptional man. Soon afterwards, Wally was assigned to the Naval Intelligence Division in London. For most of the next two years, he was an intelligence officer. He planned and implemented secret operations to Holland and France, sometimes landing and retrieving agents. The missions were dangerous. The most difficult of the operations, codenamed Tenderly, was in January 1943. Wally was on motor gun boat 318 on a mission to Triagos on the coast of France. Between the stormy weather and the weapons fire from German vessels, the gunboat was fortunate to return from the sortie. During other assignments, Wally exercised his scientific and technical knowledge. He tested and designed a modern surf boat to ensure the safety of the men infiltrating the German-occupied coast. He also designed an underwater acoustic beacon 
codenamed the FH 830. This device made it possible for naval ships to navigate with pinpoint accuracy during the Allied invasions of Sicily in 1943 and Normandy in 1944. From April to August 1943, Wally was stationed in the Middle East, Malta, and Sicily. During this time, he served on the staff of Admiral Bertram Ramsey, the man responsible for the Dunkirk evacuation and the amphibious landings for the Allied invasions of North Africa, Sicily, and Normandy. While in London, between his covert missions in England and abroad, Wally met Elizabeth Watts in 1942. They rented rooms in adjoining buildings in the historic Cheney Walk along the Thames. They were married on his 29th birthday at Battersea Church, close by Cheney Walk. After the war, they had three children, Catherine, Christopher, and Emily. In November 1944, Wally went home to Canada. For the remainder of the war, he served as the first lieutenant on Canadian destroyers along the East Coast, first the Chaudière and then the Saskatchewan. He remained active in the Royal Canadian Navy Volunteer Reserve until 1956 and retired with the rank of commander. In the summer of 1945, Wally received an unexpected offer from a place familiar to him. Bishop's University in Lenoxville, Quebec, invited him to become a lecturer in the English department. Wally did not have a degree in English, but his extensive reading, both during and after the war, more than made up for a lack of formal instruction in the discipline. At Bishop's, he had been an undergraduate student and completed his degree in classics in 1935. In studying there, he followed in his father's footsteps. And a year later, when he won the Rhodes Scholarship to study Greats and Theology at Oriel College, Oxford, he earned an honor that his father narrowly missed nearly two decades before. The very Reverend Arthur Francis Cecil Wally was descended from a line of Anglican ministers. He married Dorothy Quirk, and they had four children, Cecilia, George, Basil, and Peter. Arthur George Cuthbert Wally was born in Kingston on July 25, 1915. Four years later, the family moved to Brockville. In 1933, Cecil Wally was appointed the Dean of Nova Scotia and became chaplain to the Princess Louise Fusiliers. The family relocated to Halifax. Reverend Wally's tenure as dean lasted until 1942, when he died. George was always close to his mother, Dorothy. She encouraged him in his many pursuits, and he always wrote to her detailed and loving letters. She died in 1956. The family was close, and the home was lively. Wally remembered it as a place full of conversation. As far back as I can remember, growing up in a small Ontario town, I was always fascinated by words and language, as well as by music, and as a child listened entranced to the talk of my parents and grandparents and their friends. We were read aloud to a great deal as children. I learned to read very early and read voraciously throughout childhood. My father and grandfather were both keen classical scholars. I began to learn Latin at about seven and Greek a couple of years later. Wally's intelligence and athleticism were evident from the time he was a boy. At St. Albans School, he was the junior athletic champion. In 1929, he wrote perfect papers in algebra and geometry for the McGill University junior matriculation exams. He played on the Bishop's intermediate rugby team which won the Quebec Intercollegiate Championship. Throughout his time at Oxford, he competed in rowing. In 1938, he was Oriel College's captain of boats. He led the college's record-breaking coxswainless four in the Henley Rowing Regatta. Early on, his family nurtured in Wally a profound love of music. He learned to play the piano with great proficiency. 
and always wished to have one close by. Beethoven, Brahms, Britten, Bartók, Hindemith, and Mozart were among his favorite composers. Writing seemed to come naturally. While at boarding school, he wrote letters home. As an undergraduate student and as a naval officer, he carried on an extensive correspondence with friends and family. Over the years, he developed a distinctive style. In his writing and speaking, he was articulate and precise, having achieved an extraordinary fluency in language. During the war, Wally reflected on his experiences in the letters and the poems he wrote. By the time he returned to Bishop's in 1945, he had finished a significant number of poems about love and war. A chapbook, Poems 1939 to 1944, appeared in 1946. A larger collection, No Man and Island, was published two years later. Wally left Bishops for England in 1948 to pursue his doctorate at King's College, London. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the English poet and critic, was the focus of his studies. When he returned to Canada in 1950, he joined the English department at Queen's University in Kingston. Over the next three decades, he was a central figure in the institution. Twice he served as the head of the department. In the 1960s, he inaugurated the Film Studies program. Students were impressed by his knowledge, his eloquent speech, and his handsome appearance. He seemed to compel attention whenever he was present. In his teaching, he was notable for his extemporaneous and yet highly organized lectures and for the pregnant silences that punctuated his classes. He made literature real for the students by revealing the life of the poem, its wholeness, and its integrity as a work of art. Poetic Process, published in 1953, was Wally's first book of literary criticism. Rooted in philosophical ideas, the work made a persuasive case for the value of ways of thinking and knowing that are not scientific and technical. For the first time, Wally articulated an idea central to his mature thought. Criticism, he said, is a getting to know. Our inquiries, he argued, ought to be heuristic. That is, they should be a searching out of something that is at once familiar and unknown. In 1954, Wally wrote a radio script for the CBC entitled Death in the Barren Ground. It dramatized the story of John Hornby, Edgar Christian, and Harold Adlard. The three men had traveled and died together in the Canadian North over the winter of 1927 to 1928. Questions about the events had been in Wally's thoughts since 1937, when he first read Christian's diary. After several years of investigations into Hornby's strange and largely solitary existence, he published The Legend of John Hornby in 1962. I'd always been fascinated by polar literature and the experiences of people traveling in the Antarctic particularly and then in the Arctic. I'd experienced some of the sorts of things that Edgar Christian wrote about. I was fascinated by his diary and then later on when it was possible to learn more about Hornby I became even more fascinated by him. And what interested me was the the writing of the of the biography of uh, of finding out how to write about a person like that so that he came out of the book. For more than twenty years, Wally wrote radio plays and adaptations for the CBC. One of the most moving was "If This Is a Man." an adaptation of Primo Levi's harrowing account of life in the Nazi concentration camps. In the 1960s and 1970s, Wally worked closely with Kathleen Coburn, the general editor of Coleridge's Collected Works. He tracked down the books in which Coleridge had written. He collected the notes, sometimes lengthy, that Coleridge wrote in the margins and gradually constructed a comprehensive picture of Coleridge's reading. It was a monumental task, and yet he 
he made time for other things. In 1963, he became the president of the Kingston Symphony. For the next seven years, he helped build both the symphony and the music department at Queen's. He succeeded in bringing the renowned Vaughi Quartet to Kingston, where it became the Quartet in Residence at the University in 1968. By 1969, Wally had largely completed a translation of Aristotle's Poetics. It gave close attention to Aristotle's view of the poet as maker and the poem as something made. In rendering a translation that holds close to the Greek diction and syntax, Wally sought to startle readers into a fresh recognition of the treatise. From time to time, when the inspiration arose, he continued to write and publish poetry. George Johnston, a longtime friend and himself a poet, encouraged Wally to publish a new collection. In a series of remarkable public lectures and essays in the 1970s, Wally rediscovered and in his own style made anew a way of thinking that implicitly countered his structuralist and post-structuralist contemporaries. He enjoined others to recognize that literature embodies a process of making the world real, of making us real. In regard to language, he argued that words do not mean, but people mean, reaffirming the integrity of the individual. He became a prominent champion of the value of the humanities in the world. In 1977, Carleton University honored Wally with a Doctor of Letters degree for his many achievements. Recognitions from the University of Saskatchewan and Bishop's University soon followed. Cancer was discovered in his stomach early in 1979. In February, a major surgery removed the malignancy but permanently compromised his digestion. Afterwards, he slowly built his strength regained his health, and returned to his work. He retired from Queen's in 1980. That year, the first volume of Coleridge's Marginalia was published. Simultaneously, his new edition of Edgar Christian's Diary appeared. The cancer returned. This time, the doctors could do nothing. He died at home in Hartington on May 27, 1983. A full military escort was present for the funeral at St. George's Cathedral in Kingston. Within a few years, the appearance of several books signaled the legacy Wally bequeathed to others. The first was a selection of his essays that embodies his superb prose style. It was followed by an edition of his collected poems, a book of remembrances written by family, friends, colleagues, and students, and finally by his translation of Aristotle's Poetics. They are fitting tributes to a supremely gifted man of letters. <laughs>